Welcome back to another episode of the Welby Show and Podcast. I'm super excited to have one of my oldest friends and favorite people, Phoebe Lapine, as my guest. Um, Phoebe is one of our inspirational stories of health recovery as she was able to heal or, you know, at least come back into a normal state of health um, from her debilitating Hashimoto's in her 20s. And she's going to tell us a lot about that. And also her experience with SIBO, which was more recent. And she has taken that health situation and turned it into a real learning experience for all of us about what SIBO is. So lots of good stuff to talk about. But why don't you start from the beginning and tell us the story of beginning to have symptoms that led you to understand that you had Hashimoto's and then what happened next? Sure. So when I was 22, I had a regular checkup at my childhood doctor. And that was when I was first diagnosed with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which for those who don't know, it's an autoimmune disease that affects the thyroid gland. But all you well-be listeners probably already know that. Um, At the time, I really didn't know much about health in general and certainly didn't know what an autoimmune disease even was, what a thyroid was. And my doctor, as amazing as it is that she diagnosed me, didn't explain those things. She basically said, here's a pill. It's a synthetic form of thyroid hormone. And, you know, it's totally manageable. You'll just have to be on it for the rest of your life. And this was Synthroid. This is Synthroid. Exactly. And she was sort of a, a functional or she was no. totally conventional doctor. Okay. okay. So she was not a functional medicine doctor. She was cause she, a little bit more holistic than I'd say your average doctor. But, you know, we didn't talk that much about like lifestyle and diet. And so I think because I grew up in a household that was a little bit more organically minded and my mom was really into homeopathy as you know since we're childhood friends and the little white balls that dissolved under your tongue um and I think just like her being in the back of my mind I was like oh being on medication for the rest of my life no thanks and I wasn't really feeling any symptoms yet or so I thought because it wasn't really explained to me what the symptoms were I just knew that one of the main symptoms that they always look for is weight gain and I was losing weight and she she explained that it was probably because my thyroid was like swinging from one side of the pendulum to the other it was like running too fast um anyway the whole conversation's a blur and then moral of the story is I pretended like it never happened um, and went on living my life uh, as a 22 year old (laughs) and then I kind of the way I talk about it in my book The Wellness Project is like I slowly kind of descended from Health Mountain and started to experience these weird strange array of symptoms Um, one of the main ones that was the most debilitating was, you know, my digestion. I basically was in the fetal position after every time I ate. And I was a chef and food writer. I just quit my corporate job and was trying to make it in the industry. And so that was, you know, not optimal. But at the same time, I was really scared, you know, at least being able to connect some dots for like diet and how I was feeling. I was like, I'm probably allergic to something I'm eating, but like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like darn guess I'll just never know. What yeah. That is. I was like, I don't want to be a food writer with like food allergies either. So, um, eventually I made it to, you know, a doctor who was more holistic and functional and did a bunch of tests and put me on elimination diet, discovered that gluten was a real issue. Even he, though, didn't explain the connection between Hashimoto's and gluten to me. Um, I had to learn that later for myself. But um, kind of once I crossed the threshold and like went down the rabbit hole of exploring holistic medicine, I kind of found myself incredibly overwhelmed by all the conflicting opinions and not just the opinions, but just like the laundry list of things I had to do. And so it was kind of like the pendulum swung from denial to the other side, which wasn't like obsession for someone like me, but certainly like the amount of mental energy and the amount of money I was spending. It just felt like being healthy was a full time job. So I kind of somewhere in there came up with this idea 
to take a step back and to dedicate a year to slowly making over my health one change at a time. And the idea wasn't necessarily to be my healthiest self even. Like obviously I wanted to feel good when I woke up in the morning. But the question was like, which of all of these things that people are talking about is actually worth my time, money, and energy? And I say that I was like in search of something called healthy hedonism, which to me is like the balance between the things that nourish your body and the things that feed your spirit and you know the hedonism side the spirit side it could be any number of things for some people like you know a workout class really does feed your spirit and for others it does not and you may want to like just walk to work (laughs) so it was finding that crossroad for myself across a whole variety of categories. Um, I also felt like during my like more obsessive times, I was getting really bogged down with diet and exercise, which are like the two main prongs that so many people in the wellness site guys just like really hone in on and they can become stumbling blocks. So I wanted to make sure I was paying equally and as much attention to like sleep, hydration, stress management, um, kind of all of these other incredibly important aspects of lifestyle. So yeah, I kind of It changed month to month, but I tried to do just like a handful um, or one main goal experiment and then to find like kind of sub sub things to do to get me there. Um, And yeah, by the end, you know, my thyroid numbers had done a 180. I mean, I went in and like I was basically like clinically malnourished. I was like low in every single vitamin and mineral. And by the end, that had had changed. Um, I still struggle with my antibodies. I'm not going to lie. and yeah, my health is like an ongoing, you know. You know, I have thyroid antibodies now too. Oh. Which came like a year or two ago after like a decade of just hypothyroidism. But now, like you, I've kind of had to learn so much about what takes something from hypothyroidism to autoimmunity and like how you can sort of undo that and what are those major triggers. And what I've found is that it's really overwhelming. There's like seven yeah. different reasons that you know, autoimmunity comes on. And so, well, first of all, you mentioned the the connection between gluten and Hashimoto. So can you actually explain what that is? Because that's been a really huge learning experience for me as somebody who tried to, like you, ignore being like, I want bread in a restaurant. Like, I mean, I still want bread in a restaurant. Yeah. But it's been, it wasn't until I understood, really understood the connection that it made it like easier for me to just say it's not worth it. Yeah. So basically, you know, with any sort of autoimmune disease, your body can't distinguish friend from foe. So if you have, it's kind of like a chicken or the egg situation. If you have something creating inflammation, creating, you know, your forcing your immune armies to like raise their pitchforks, um, they are going to maybe accidentally attack some other things in their wake. Um, And, you know, a lot the consequence of autoimmune disease a lot of times is like that is your own tissue. Um, But since like we have actual thyroid antibodies and once those are circulating in our blood system and like sending signals to the immune army, um, anything that looks slightly similar to the thyroid protein is going to be, you know, a culprit as well. So the gluten protein and the thyroid protein look very similar. So when your body is attacking one, it's going to attack the other. Um, So it's like both going to fan the flames of any inflammation that's actually happening and potentially like stoke the fire of your immune system, you know, just on its own. Once I sort of understood that after, you know, a year of being like, yeah, I have these antibodies. I know I'm supposed to like not eat all these things, do all these other things for my stress management, like all the things that you sort of, you know, were feeling when you started to do the wellness project. And you really feel like health is a full-time job and almost like, well, it's not even worth trying all these things if I can't do them all because it's a you know right. busy time in my life or I don't have the money or like all this other stuff. But then I swung the other direction and realized, okay, there are some that stick out as more important than mm-hmm. others for, you know, at least quelling Hashimoto's, yeah. if not reversing it. And one of those is gluten. But yeah. are, were there any others from writing the wellness project that you found were more impactful than others? Um, for Hashimoto specifically, for me, it's like it either had to have like a huge physical benefit that I could like viscerally experience or it has to be something that was like fairly painless and didn't impact my life. And I think the hardest 
thing for a lot of people is like the toxic burden. So like chemicals that are in our personal care products, chemicals in our water, like you take those out and you're not going to see an overnight difference in the same way as like even just one day of not eating added sugar, alcohol, caffeine, you will like see some sort of effect whether that's like caffeine withdrawal you know it's like you'll right you'll oh yeah. you'll notice that it has a physical impact for better or worse but you know these chemicals it's all about how they build over time um heavy metals also and i think for me it was it was kind of a category that fell on the second side which that it didn't have a big actual impact on my life and For me, I need to like have good reasoning behind it. So like the common sense of it, like just made total sense to me. I don't need a hundred studies. It's like, yeah, like there are studies that these chemicals like do really horrible things to your body and like specifically for your thyroid, like chlorine and fluoride, not great for your thyroid, um, complicates how iodine is processed, which complicates how, you know, the ability for your gland to function to begin with. So For me, like the least painful things were the things that were one time changes that I never had to think about again and switching all my beauty products to naturals. That was an easy one. Like I've just never bought conventional ones since and it took time and it, you know, was definitely a financial investment at the beginning. Um, There's also ways to go about it where you just do it slowly over time. Um, But yeah, that wasn't something where I necessarily saw night and day. Um changes in my skin um I did see those from diet and then I think changing my products like really helped me maintain them um and I know that all those chemicals like had to have been helpful and like helping me reboot and then the other one was yeah getting that fluoride and chlorine out of my daily drinking water um you think about like how much you ingest like it's pretty crazy and knowing those specific chemicals are problematic for thyroid health um just putting a one-time filter on my tap like never have to think think about it not ever again but like in a year when you have to change the filter um those yeah were just great I didn't have to like lease any mental space to them again you mentioned your skin so your major symptoms when you were, I mean, having known you since you were six, I can tell you were always a string bean, like a little scrawny string bean. So the idea that you were like losing weight beyond your like normal string bean is like insane to me. I don't even know what that looked like, like a skeleton maybe. Um, well, I was less of a string bean in college, Adrian. Oh, okay. <laughs> so some of the weight was naturally going to fall off after I graduated. <laughs> Irrelevant. I mean, yeah. what? Who doesn't have like a tire during exactly, college? Exactly. Exactly. Um, but anyway, so you had, you know, weight loss that you didn't really yeah. want or it was going too far. Yeah. And then yeah. you had a lot of skin issues and obviously you had your you know, your gut issues after you would eat, you would feel an effect of something, which is like a pretty big hello, yeah. you know, for your body to be like, we're not okay here. You yeah. Know, the please, skin, please help. Yeah. The skin was a big one and it really took a while to like get my attention in terms of like connecting to these other things. I mean, I was taking antibiotics all the time for these skin issues. I just, I mean, it was steroids probably, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was doing all of the things at the same time that I was trying to do all of these other things, like like getting the chlorine out of my water. (laughs) Like, So what did these people tell you giving you antibiotics and steroids about what could be causing these like big skin breakouts? It's like chapter one of the book. No answers. It's like, it's something, something's out of balance. And like, that's totally right. But they just did not have any um, interest in helping helping to find what that something was. Um, And yeah, still to this day, I mean, I get a lot of emails from people and messages. Like I got one from someone um, in my course that I do four weeks to wellness. Um, She had eczema um, and she had taken, I think maybe just like dairy out of her diet and, but had never done a full elimination diet. I was like, Oh, well you should try, you know, some of these other potential allergens like gluten, corn, soy. And she was like, well, I haven't seen any studies connecting corn to eczema. And it's just like, the skin issues is just a symptom. Like it could be different for every person. Like I guess I have my own podcast now for this SIBO stuff, which we'll get into. But, you know, if there's anything I've learned from that is like every one of us has our own weaknesses. Like for me, mine's like thyroid and hormone health. Mine's just like general like and gut, <laughs> like neurological <laughs> stimulus. Um, but 
you know, for some people that's going to show up as skin. For others, it's going to show up as joint pain. For others, it's going to show up as hair loss. Like you never really know what you're going to get. And it's hard to, to find the source of the inflammation. Like you have to just kind of, um, keep trial and error pulling the layers exactly back. Yeah. and same for you know a lot of the tick-borne illnesses yeah. like Spencer my brother who you know um he was so sick with Lyme and joint pain to the point where like my dad would be taking him to the emergency room in the middle of the night screaming bloody murder waking up the whole house just like holding his legs you know but then I had Lyme and all of my symptoms are just like extreme fatigue and like um short-term memory loss where yeah. you know I'd look at you you'd say your name I'd look away like I or I'd look at a, a number on a page and look away and then but the joint pain didn't affect me at all and it was like how is that possible and it's because your gut bacteria and your mm-hmm. you know very unique set of you know cells and everything else that's going on inside you interacting with these allergens as they come in for you is gluten and these other toxins and whatever that is or spirochete as it comes in um which is what lime is it causes so many different things and yeah. like to be like oh no you must not have it as bad yeah. i always thought oh my lime isn't as bad as my brother's because he has this joint pain and it was like no it's just manifesting in a certain way for yeah. you um and it could be like we're female or we had other hormonal mm-hmm. issues and that's why it was that way or whatever it is but um I've stopped kind of thinking about it like that and just sort of like his symptoms are just a Chinese menu of ways that your body is screaming for help. Exactly. And they're not, you know, one is not necessarily worse than the other. So you go on this wellness journey and you write a book about it called The Wellness Project, which I read and loved. And you can get it. I'll put the link in the show notes. And um, you then get better I mean your skin is beautiful I'm looking at it right now I can't find it summertime is always they're good months for me I can't find a single blemish um (laughs) if I tried and uh your weight seems to be a normal yeah situation as well as it seems like from following you on various platforms your gut seems to be relatively okay these days yeah it's progressing in a better direction I mean these things again it's like I love (laughs) writing the book was a funny experience because, you know, editors, publishers, they want a story that's (laughs) going to have like a real transformation. Right. Like wrapped up with a little bow. Exactly. It's over. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, the year's over, but like I'm still a work in progress. Like my health's still going to like ebb and flow. And, you know, I've had many cases of food poisoning since I had like these great blood work results and like, you know, great conclusion to the year um, and have had to like reach back into the toolkit and like start all over again. Speaking of that. So after you wrote the book and then you were diagnosed with something called SIBO, which Mm -hmm. stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. um, It seems to be, I mean, I can't remember ever hearing the word or the acronym SIBO before like four years ago. Yeah. Three I mean, years ago. People were not talking about it. So five what, plus years ago. What is this? When did it come up for you? What did you like? How did you sort of navigate it? All that. Yeah. So about like nine months into my book tour, it was kind of a stressful year. Um, it was very exciting, but also involved a lot of travel and just like exertion mentally and physically and I was feeling real a lot of gastro symptoms as a result and I just you know if if my book taught me anything like stress is so powerful and I was just like I'm just stressed I'm off I've been traveling all the time Um, but then once the book tour died down I was like oh like actually no I'm just like really bloated all the time after meals and I'm burping and like all, you know, a whole host of things that were just definitely not my new normal. Um, so I decided to go back to my functional medicine doctor, I get a full workup and, um, long story short, he, I got tested for SIBO, which was the first time that I, not the first time I'd heard of it, but, um, the first time I'd ever been tested and it came back positive and it made complete sense when I read more about it. Um, basically it's not an issue of bad bacteria versus good bacteria. It's just your bacteria is in the wrong place. So, um, the funny thing is I wrote a whole chapter about gut health for my book, about eating for your microbiome, about like probiotics, fermented foods, what actually works. And, um, all the things that were, 
in a good gut diet were basically the opposite of this trend called the low FODMAP diet, which was being tested with a lot of really compelling research as like a symptom reducer for IBS folks. And I just was so confused by that. Like the entire time I was writing the book and afterwards, because I was getting lots of requests for it on my site. And so I just started producing recipes for it because it was what people wanted. And I, but I just didn't understand. I was like, this can't be good for your gut long term. Um, but now that I, then once I was diagnosed with SIBO and learned more about it and discovered that they're saying like 60% of IBS is actually SIBO, it made complete sense why IBS people would be feeling better on this diet. Um, And it's because you're actually not supposed to have very much bacteria in your small intestines at all. When people talk about like your gut microbiome, it's really more talking about the large intestines, which is something I didn't even know to parse through when I was doing this original research. Um, And the reason for that is because your small intestine is where you're absorbing all your nutrients. So if you have bacteria up there, they're going to be competing for those food resources. And that's fine when it's just the matter of undigested fiber, which is what they do feed off of in the large intestines. But when they're eating it that high up, they're going to be off gassing and they're going to be a lot further away from the escape route down there. It's so going to get going up. So they're yeah. going up or it's getting trapped. And like the SIBO type bloating is not just like, you know, a little bit of a, a belly after meals. It's like really uncomfortable distension for a lot of people. Um, so I did an herbal treatment protocol, um, actually was lucky and did a modified low FODMAP diet and was lucky I kicked it on the first time. I didn't have crazy numbers. Um, but just that whole process I found so fascinating. I wrote about it and the response I got to like the three posts I wrote was insane. They became like quickly my most read posts of all time. And I was like, oh, like people are really hungry for this information. And I know because I wrote the post because I was like, there isn't that much good information out there. There are a few sites who do a great job, but um, not that like synthesize it in a way that people can easily digest. So that's why I also started the podcast on the subject. And yeah, I'm SIBO free, but my rehabilitation from it and like kind of work to rebalance my gut is ongoing. And I should also mention that Hashimoto's is a big precursor to SIBO because it all boils down to how your motility is working and this thing called the migrating motor complex. I was like, can you explain motility? Yeah, I know. It's like there's, (laughs) by the way, I'm writing a book on SIBO now and there's going to be a term glossary because it's hilarious. Everyone is like read up on SIBO. Like we're all like fluent in the terms, but you know, these are the rest of us. No, but it's like these medical terms I'd never heard researching a whole book on health for a year. Um, So motility is essentially like your, Um, Well, it can apply to the small or or large intestines, but it's how well, you know, the kind of nerve and muscle system is working to push through food through your body. Um, So the migrating motor complex, which is, you know, what people kind of refer to when they're talking about like how well your motility is working. It's kind of like the internal street sweeper of your small intestines. And it's something that there now there's a lot of compelling research um, finding that for people who have been through bouts of food poisoning and had, you know, their immune system attack acutely that area. Let's talk about the um, the misfires. It's actually the nerve cells in the migrating motor complex that get killed in that attack. And so it they eventually regenerate, um, but it takes time. And in the process, your motility, your small intestine is not going to be moving food as fluidly through your system as possible. And that's when the bottleneck and the overgrowth can begin. So did you have any bouts with food poisoning prior to getting your SIBO diagnosis? That could have been like... Yeah, many. Oh, yeah. Or or, or like it doesn't have to be close by, you're saying. No, and it's actually often you don't feel different. And then three months down the line, you're like, I have all these weird symptoms. And then um, there is a test that you can do to see if that's what the cause of your SIBO is. Um, post-infectious IBS test. Hashimoto's is a precursor to SIBO because it tends to mess with your motility. Um, So, and a lot of people with Hashimoto's may be like more prone to constipation. That's one of the reasons. And so um, when you just have anything and there are, it's like a whole 
page laundry list of contributing risk factors for SIBO. But anything that messes with motility, it can be a traumatic brain injury, it could be Lyme, it could be so many things that's going to, you know, just make you more at risk. Fascinating. So why do you think no one was talking about this before? It's not like it's a new development in like the human body or it's just a new development in science maybe that they're yeah. understanding that yeah. there's an actual different situation that occurs in the yeah. small intestines. So Dr. Mark Pimentel, who's at Mount Sinai, he's like the main guy who's researching all this, but he came up with this concept in the 80s or 90s, The not the acronym SIBO, but the idea that it was a bacterial overgrowth happening in the small intestines. That was the reason why we had such issues with IBS. Um, and since then, that's what all of his research has been trying to uncover the latest in terms of this post-infectious IBS connection, like is all part of his um, studies that he's doing out in LA. So yeah, it's not, it's, they, there were different words for it like 20 years ago, but um, yeah, SIBO as an acronym and as a condition is way entering, you know, the consciousness now. It's still something that there needs to be more awareness of, but it's also, you know, people are getting diagnosed with it left and right, which is why there's a real need for like more information. Yeah. So what is the common, you know, test or diagnosis that you would do if you think you might have SIBO? So there's a breath test and there are a few different types. Um, like all the SIBO stuff is so complicated. <laughs> but, like the thyroid stuff too. I yeah. mean, you managed to collect two very complicated yeah. conditions. Well, if you're, if you're interested in the SIBO testing stuff, I have a post on my site, SIBO 101, that has, breaks down all the different tests. But essentially it's a breath test um, that's measuring you drink a sugar solution and then breathe into a tube every 20 minutes. And it's measuring the off-gassing from bacteria. And there's a lot of controversy in terms of what these tests, how accurate these tests are and what they actually tell you. But in theory, it's if you see spikes in certain gases, which can only be caused by bacteria before like the 90 minute mark, like that's an indication that you have, you know, bacteria too far up in your canal, um, in your small intestines. Got it. Yeah. So anybody who wants more information on SIBO in general should check out Phoebe's podcast because it's called SIBO Made Simple. <laughs> um, it's and not then, simple, spoiler <laughs> alert, but we try. <laughs> um, but also her site because she has some really good um, SIBO overview articles as well. Okay, so now today, I know like me, health is really a journey. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, entered this whole wellness world after certain things had happened and then sort of wanted to tie a whole ribbon on, you know, oh, like kicked Lyme, kicked amenorrhea, you know, went through this tragedy with the mental health care system and my mom, but now I'm just, you know, healthy forever because I have all the answers. And then this, you know, yeah, right. Uh, Ashimoto <laughs> thing ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, just came up and was like, not so fast. Um, but it really just reminded me because I definitely needed to be reminded that health is seriously a journey and that you cannot take your eye off the prize for, I mean, you know, a couple days on a fun vacation or something like that. Um, you know, absolutely. But if you are regularly, you know, eating poorly, not paying attention to stress, not sleeping properly, yeah. um, using all of these toxins, uh, whatever it is, it will eventually, your body will let you know in one yeah. way or another. And there's just like no free lunch in this, no. in this space. Um, and I was definitely, you know, stealing from my stress reserves, which I hadn't, you know, done in a long time in my life. Like I'd had other, you know, stressful periods where I uh, maybe was um, grieving or, you know, studying a lot, but like just a constant state of yeah. anxiety and kind of like <sighs> hadn't really, you know, ever manifested for like as long as I took it. I threw everything I knew out the window and I feel like now I'm back to if you're not careful, like you will go down that path. Like it's yeah. almost like, yes, you could probably walk in a dangerous neighborhood 
without you know protection or whatever and yeah. be fine but if you do it every single night like maybe you know you're asking yeah, for, for something chances, bad to happen yeah yeah your chances increase so back to the wellness project-esque yeah, foundation yeah, yeah of keeping myself that you know keeping things in check and so Hashimoto, SIBO you know hopefully this, these are your only two major hurdles as yeah. far as like conditions but it's part of this whole series of inspirational stories of health recovery that we tell is to show people that we're not, you know, hippie weirdos that, you know, gravitate towards, you know, rejecting conventional healthcare. Like you were going to all of those doctors asking for help and not getting anybody to help you with the root cause stuff. And so finally you went a different path and you know what, that wasn't the only thing that happened and you had to go yeah. back to it for the SIBO situation and hopefully that's it, but you'll, you'll have the tools and the resources should these things um, come up again. And really to show people that there's hope, like that same girl at 22 getting a Hashimoto's diagnosis and being given Synthroid and telling, you know, being told she's going to be on it the rest of her life. You don't have to. I mean, you're proof of that. Well, I am on medication. And I probably would be better off had I gone on the Synthroid, <laughs> but I would have probably also still had a lot of mysterious symptoms that I never would have connected the dots on or discovered on my own. Right. But I mean, you take a more natural yes, version yes. and there's less chance of side effects yes, and things yes, like that. Correct. So um, I, that might not have even been possible had you not done all these other oh, things. Oh, yeah. To repair oh, I wasn't told thyroid. there were other, even any other options for medication. It may not oh, be yeah. effective for you if you weren't doing all these other things to help yes, your thyroid correct, repair itself. Correct. So that's, you know, really what I think this story can show people is that it's not Synthroid or nothing. Um, yeah. If you do want to try a more natural thyroid medication, you can, you probably also have to do other things to restore oh, yeah. your thyroid health and continue to nurture it. Yeah. The medication's not doing anything for your antibodies. So that's where lifestyle comes in. Right. Yeah. Exactly. My last question for you before we just hang out and close out the day is we say at Weldy, like how I get Weldy is, and you have so many things that you've oh learned over God. the years, but this is really just your like, cannot miss these two, three things a day where no matter what mm. you are traveling, you are stressed, you are writing a book, you are home, you are not you do these without fail or you find yourself going off in a direction you don't like. How I get well be <laughs> is making sure that I unplug for at least a few hours a night and do not have my phone off of airplane mode in the bedroom. I'm working on getting it out of there completely. Um, taking five minutes at least of just breath work and um, pseudo meditation, ideally 20 minutes of real meditation, but I'll take the five minutes and making sure that I have at least 10% of my day that's doing something that feeds my spirit or nourishes me in some way, um, whether that's taking a bath, going for a walk, um, doing something that feels indulgent in its way because again back to the health can be a full-time job sometimes self-care gets is like <laughs> the enemy of self-care <laughs> I end up laughing myself when I think about the morning routines I get up in the morning and I'm like already like oh my god I'm supposed to be journaling I'm supposed yep, to be meditating yep, yep. I'm supposed to be stretching I'm supposed to be gratitude this that yep, yep, and then yep. I've got to make my smoothie and the, it's it's insane it's too much um who could ever you know do all of those things so I think that's similar to like we're all so unique on the inside as far as where we show symptoms and mm -hmm. how and how all this stuff impacts us also you kind of have to have your own not to overuse the word gut reaction to like what actually does feel like self-care I kind of hate baths so great right yeah like, everyone tells you that's what you're supposed to do but I'm no. like wait actually I don't like this you're not alone <laughs> I sometimes I feel them, like I, I am and sometimes I work in the bathtub and that's bad <laughs> like with a laptop mm -hmm. oh man yeah that's um bad. that's yeah. not self-care just for the record <laughs> that's just doing your work in that's the just, bathtub <laughs> that's just yeah, playing just with fire living on the edge yeah <laughs> awesome well thank you for sharing your story and all the amazing stuff you're doing now with SIBO and thyroid health and everybody can check out Phoebe at 
feedmephoebe.com or thewellnessproject.com. Awesome. As we said before, we are going on, no, 28 oh God. years, yeah. 27 years 27 of being friends. 26 yeah. or 7. Wow. And how, and our moms were, you know, these integrative health nuts. Mm-hmm. So somehow we ended up talking on a Turning podcast into them. Yeah. <laughs> with an iPhone <laughs> in my apartment. It's just really hysterical to me sometimes, but it's so fun too. So this is great. Yay. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Thanks for, for having joining me. In. Bye. Bye.